Good evening. It gives me a great pleasure welcoming everyone to the second talk in the Open Health Systems Colloquium series. Indian prehistory, uh, prehistory, how a multidisciplinary approach involving population genetics, archaeology, and linguistics is solving some of the oldest problems and can be used to solve many more. By Mr. Tony Joseph, senior journalist and author of Early Indians, the story of our ancestors and where we came from, which has been the inspiration for this talk. Before we begin, I would like to take your permission to take a moment to remember Ms. Premala Ghosh. She was the chief uh, program officer who passed away only a few days ago, on the 6th of uh, July. It was a conversation with her on this book that uh, sparked up the idea of having this talk. And she was very happy we were doing it. And we greatly miss her today. So thank you. The Open Health Systems Colloquium is a collaboration between the Open Health Systems Laboratory and the India International Center seeking to bring together thought leaders to present and discuss issues of life sciences in an effort to provoke innovative and holistic thinking. The aim is also to open these discussions into public domain, such that the latest developments in uh, biomedical sciences are accessible to those interested, and to spark debate and deliberation across disciplines. A series of four colloquiums have been planned for uh, 2019. The next in the series is a book launch and a talk entitled The Perfect Predator, a scientist race to save her husband from a deadly superbug. This is by Dr. Stephanie Stradley, and it will be held on, the, uh, on November 19, 2019. The Open Health System Laboratory, a social enterprise incorporated in California, was created out of the work of Anil Srivastava, Dr. Kenneth Butro, and Martin Deutsch with CA Big, the Cancer Biomedical Information Grid, about a decade ago, OHSL has teams located in the University of Maryland Biopark in Baltimore, California, and India. We were honored to have Dr. Butro as our first speaker of this series in March this year. And many of you, I'm happy to see, were also there uh, in March, uh, where he delivered a talk on Cancer Knowledge Alliance. OHSL firmly believes in the principle of collaborative science, or as it is now called, team science, bringing expertise and knowledge from diverse fields, institutions, and countries together in order to address important challenges of life sciences through international collaborations or consortia working on in uh, the translational research mode. Cancer is one of the key areas of focus of OHSL. Some of the collaborations that OHSL is part of and has played a key role in building are the International Cancer Knowledge Alliance, the Indo-US Advanced Radiotherapy Consortium, the Ayurveda Developmental Therapeutics Program, the International Bacteriophage Research Consortium, and there are others being built as we speak. In this, we have been closely working with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, Tata Memorial Center, the Delhi University, <coughs> Prolistress, among other institutes, to, uh, institutions. At present, OHSL is working towards building an incubation platform in India where young researchers with ideas can come and a support system of mentorship in uh, infrastructure and collaborations can be built around them to further their research goals. Today's talk by Mr. Joseph is the second in the Open Health Systems Colloquium series. We are privileged to have, the, uh, have with us Mr. Kane Srivastava, not only as director of the India International Center, but as someone who is very relevant to the subject of today's talk, as former Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, which has been closely associated with the Harappan excavations. We are also privileged to have with us Professor Kenneth Butro and Professor Parthu Majumdar, well known, uh, both very well known and, uh, in the international scientific community, and both doyans in the field of genomics. The subject has been a matter of great debate for both historical and political reasons. reasons. Leaving aside whatever political contentions there may be, we wish to use the opportunity that the scientific evidence has given us and, uh, has given us and explore the implications of these findings in biomedical research through this discussion. Both Dr. Butra and Dr. Mojimdar will draw from, will draw from and provide the context to this. Uh, from uh, in to Dr. Joseph's talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Professor 
Uh, Majumdar has very kindly agreed to chair today's discussion. He is the founder of the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics in uh, West Bengal. He is a distinguished professor in the institute and also an emeritus professor of the Indian Statistical Institute. He is uh, Sir J.C. Bose National Fellow and an elected fellow of all three science academies of uh, India. He is currently the president of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. He is also a member of the organizing committee of the International Human Cell Atlas Consortium and the Indian National Coordinator of the International Cancer Genome Consortium. He is, of course, a recipient of many distinguished awards. His work on genetic diversity of ethnic Indian populations has resulted in a clear reconstruction of the processes of peopling of the Indian subcontinent, which have had major impacts on the design of studies for mapping disease genes. It also has an impact on studies of drug interactions in diverse populations. He was one of the early human gen uh, geneticists to re uh, recognize the importance of studying genetic structures of ethnic populations using molecular genetic tools in order to discover genes conferring susceptibilities to various common diseases. I would now like to invite Mr. Srivastava, Mr. Joseph, Dr. Buto, and Dr. Majumdar to take their places on the dais. And I request Mr. Srivastava to give the introdu uh, introductory address. Dignitaries on the dais, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to listen to the talk of uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Joseph, who has just published his uh, book, The Early Indians. I was fortunate to get a copy of this book some time back. I must confess that I have not gone through the book completely, but half of it I have certainly have read. I must compliment the efforts put in by Tony in uh, putting the things in perspective by a great deal of uh, research. When I was discussing with him just a few minutes back, he told me that uh, he is not a historian or an archaeologist, but the kind of research that he has done in uh, bringing out this book, putting the facts in perspective, certainly excels him both as historian as well as an archaeologist. He has, his study is largely based on scientific uh, principles of uh, genomes and uh, DNA. He has analyzed various artifacts which have been found in relevant parts of the world for this uh, book. And uh, he has tried to uh, indicate as to where from the early Indians came and how this uh, country of India, what is also known as Aryavarth, has been inhabited. Uh, friends, this is an issue where a lot of debates have taken place in the past, and the debates are not going to come to an end uh, early either. Uh, no doubt, the book very clearly indicates that uh, originally the people came from uh, Africa, then uh, from Iran and from the East Asian uh, countries. But I, uh, since I have worked in the ASI, uh, I still have several questions, you know, which is uh, haunting my mind. One is that if that was the case, and, uh, so, sorry, before that, let me say that in the book, uh, uh, Tony says, and I would like him to explain during his talk, he accepts that there was a river, though it may not be called Saraswati River. According to, I mean, uh, this river is Gagar River or some, by some other name. And there was a, uh, you know, very flourishing, you know, civilization residing between uh, this river and the uh, Sindh River. Uh, one group calls Harappan civilization or Sindhu Valley, you know, civilization. Uh, he says that. Uh, uh, there was a monsoonal change and because though this uh, Gaga river used to be only a red river 
and uh, because of this monsoonal change, the flow in the river stopped, and therefore it affected the population. And uh, naturally, the people had to shift to other places. My own thinking is, if that is the case, uh, how come we are not able to find any Harappan sites across Jamuna River? Uh, most of the Harappan sites that we had pre-independent India are post-independence. They are mostly found, you know, across this river what I just mentioned, and in between uh, this river, Dagar and uh, Sindh. My own feeling is that much more research is required to be done. I feel that unless the Indus is strictly deciphered, the truth will never come out in full. Two efforts have been made, uh, but still not, uh, hardly any breakthrough. There are two, uh, I would say, I'd like to mention two names. One of the name he has already discussed in his book, Mr. Mahadevan, and the second is Professor S.R. Rao. Uh, S.R. Rao has got his own uh, uh, interpretation of whatever. Uh, actually, S.R. Rao worked in ASI for a long time, and uh, he has uh, done a lot of research, and he has given a particular theory which says that there is a continuum of Indian Trail Ice, etc. Uh, then uh, Dr. Mahadevan has got a different uh, you know, perspective. He has also done a lot of research, etc. But ultimately, we are not really able to find convergence. My own view is that unless the Indus script is deciphered, the truth will never come out. Uh, I would, in this regard, I would like to recall that uh, till Jens Precept deciphered Brahmi script, we really did not know much about Ashoka or that period of history. Only after the disarmament of the script in 1830 that the whole uh, treasure of uh, history and truth you know, really came out and uh, uh, things were put in the right perspective. So with these few uh, words, I would like to end here. And again, I would like to stress that for us as Indians, we have to really put our might uh, in uh, f uh, fostering research to see that Indus script someday gets no deciphered. And until that is done, the theories will be there, assumptions will be there, but the finality will never reach. So with these few words, I end here. And once again, I compliment uh, Tony for the monumental work that he has done. And I'm sure the other two <coughs> uh, you know, experts of genome, uh, genomes, uh, Mr. Dr. Machundar and uh, uh, Dr. Buton, are going to further highlight us the scientific aspect and uh, perhaps we will be able to get <coughs> some clearer picture. So with these words, I end here. And thank you once again, all of you. Thank you, Mr. Shivastu. I'd now invite uh, Dr. Majumdar to introduce the speakers and chair the proceedings. Well, first of all, let me thank all of you for uh, coming here this evening for this talk. I'm absolutely delighted to be called upon to introduce the speaker and uh, my dear friend, Ken Buto. Uh, before I do so, two people come to my mind. The Indian International Center has allowed its podium to be used uh, for these kinds of talks about uh, where do we come from, uh, the peopling of India, and so on. Uh, the two people who come to my mind, one is Professor M. G. K. Menon, no more, uh, Professor uh, 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 Madam uh, Primola Ghosh, uh, who passed away just about a week or 10 days back. Both of them were very active and uh, promoted uh, the dissemination of knowledge in this particular area of science. Uh, today we have two speakers, so I'll first introduce my friend Ken Buteau. Um, I've known Ken Buto for decades. Uh, he is a very prominent uh, geneticist, human geneticist, uh, worked in the area of cancer for a very long time, uh, became, uh, slowly transformed himself into a computational biologist, uh, provided, um, you know, inferences from huge data sets when he was at the National Cancer Institutes, uh, Institute at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Uh, subsequently, he has moved to the Arizona State University, still continues to be uh, very active computationally and in the area of cancer. Um, he is um, right now uh, head of the uh, Institute of Evolutionary Medicine, 
So he looks at medicine from an evolutionary perspective and uh, you know, where people come from, how people have moved, etc., do have an impact on evolutionary medicine. So he's a professor and head of the Center for Evolutionary Medicine in the Arizona State uh, University. Uh, he uh, also is a friend of India. He's been coming to India uh, and is helping various cancer researchers, notably the Tata Memorial Hospital and the Advanced Center for Research, Training and Education in Cancer in Navi, Mumbai. Uh, so I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that Ken can be here. And like I said, that we were much young, much younger, many years ago since when uh, we have known each other at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, our speaker this evening is uh, Mr. Tony Joseph. Uh, Mr. Joseph has been in um, uh, writing, has been um, you know, in correspondence, in various kinds of um, uh, correspondence, and uh, he has been a science writer for some time. He was, uh, uh, he's been an editor associated with various kinds of newspapers, um, such as the Business Standard, uh, such as the Economic Times, and um, also he almost uh, single-handedly set up the business world. Uh, the, the newspaper. So um, he has been in the business of writing for a long time, but uh, in in this area of um, uh, you know questioning where do we come from, who are, who the early Indian, Indians were, etc. He of course had to do a lot of research, and he's told me that he has done this research for about six years before he actually uh, was able to make sense of the kind of things that he was reading. Um, so this, this is an outcome, The Early Indians, the book that he has written, is an outcome of six years of research in various areas of science, in, uh, well, linguistics, um, archaeology, um, anthropology, genetics, and so on and so forth. And those of us who have been fortunate to be able to read that book uh, know the depth to which he has gone. And I can also share another piece of information with you. Uh, six years from now, there will be another book. And that book will be, uh, again, talking about how society emerged in India. So we are looking forward to his second book. It may not take six years anymore, because I think he knows uh, <laughs> how to read uh, literature and scientific literature, etc. So it's, uh, we are absolutely looking forward to a delightful evening of knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing, and uh, drawing inferences and controversies. Thank you very much. May I request you to uh, turn your cell phones down? And may I request uh, Ken to uh, say a few words before uh, Tony tells us about his story. Thank you very much. I just have a couple of quick comments that's actually related to my role now uh, in the Center for Evolution and Medicine. Uh, and partially what I want to share with this audience is that oftentimes when we have this discussion of where do we come from, it feels like an abstract kind of conversation that seems that is trying to understand what's happened in the past. Uh, what I think is important as we're now starting to look forward is that we're recognizing that the both the genetics and ethno backgrounds of our populations make a huge difference with respect to health, how health emerges, uh, and the context in which health uh, actually is maintained. Uh, in our work in evolutionary medicine, what we realize is that context is really critical in determining uh, whether someone is healthy in a particular environment or whether someone actually is unhealthy. And the genetic and ancestral background as well as the cultural context that someone has been raised in actually makes a huge difference as to how one manifests both well-being uh, as well as disease. So one of the things I'm very interested in hearing is uh, as this, uh, what has historically been a pretty uh, empty page on the world script of the understanding of the underlying genetic architecture of of India and the entire Indian subcontinent as work with my colleague Dr. Mazumdar as well as the work that's emerging among other members of the broader community as exemplified in, uh, in Mr. Joseph's work actually helps fill in some of those individual pictures and may actually explain why, for instance, in cancer India has a dramatic difference depending on the regional area that one arises with high incidences of different cancer in different regions. Why is that the case? Uh, and hopefully, as we now better understand the underlying backgrounds of populations, we may actually be able to have better clues as to how to intervene to have better health for everyone. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to uh, Pardon? 
thing, right? No. think that uh, good evening friends it is a pleasure to be here today and I thank the open health systems laboratory the India International Center uh, mr. Anil Srivastava uh, and uh, dr. Anil Srivastava for giving this giving me this opportunity to address this August audience today uh, and also for the kind introductions of uh, Dr. Konanika Roy, Mr. Srivastava, and uh, especially, especially Professor Partha Majumdar, uh, whose work, whose tremendous amount of work in population genetics has been both uh, illuminating for me as well as a guiding uh, force in, in, in working on this project for over the last six years. And thank you to uh, Professor Buto for the introduction and for the for being here today. The topic today is uh, how a multidisciplinary approach is solving old problems in Indian history, Indian prehistory, and this will be based on my experience on writing early Indians, which was published about six months ago. I'm not an academic, as by by now you know, uh, or a scientist. And in some ways, I, have, I can be seen as exactly the kind of person who should not have attempted a book of this kind. Uh, but the reception the book has received from the academic and scientific community suggests that the effort has not been entirely futile. I believe in a peculiar sort of way, a combination of lucky circumstances gave me certain advantages uh, and that accounts for the unlikely reception the book has, had, was, book has received. Uh, the first lucky circumstance was that I had an almost unlimited amount of time uh, to devote to this project. This is all that I did for six years. The second lucky circumstance is that when I started on this project, the questions on my mind were not who were the Indians or where did we come from, but a more limited set of questions related to who the Harappans were. The Harappans had fascinated me ever since the Harappan civilization one read about. And when I had time on my hand, this is what I decided to focus on. And this was lucky because there is no better vantage point from which to address the question of who the Indians are. The Harappan civilization is both the high point and the middle point of Indian population formation. And um, it provides you both the altitude and the location to get a good feel for what is lying around. The third lucky circumstance was that I was wedded to my questions and, and uh, not to any particular discipline or even to the answers. The answers could come from anywhere and could be anything as long as they address the questions squarely. So I went to leading scientists and academics from every discipline uh, from around the world, over 30 of them, who had anything to say about Indian population formation over six years. This meant I had to get familiar with the, in the best way that I could, with the disciplines as different as archaeology, linguistics, genetics, philology, and epigraphy, and figure out the basic assumptions uh, they were making. Each discipline has its limitations because of the methodology it follows. And it is important to know what these limitations are if you are to make intelligent cross-disciplinary use of data. I will explain this with an example. If you ask geneticists and archaeologists, when did the ancestors of today's Indians first arrive in India, they are definitely going to give you conflicting answers. Archaeologists are likely to give an answer that could go as far back as 120,000 years ago. Geneticists are unlikely to go beyond 65,000 years or so. This apparently irreconcilable conflict goes away when you realize that the two disciplines are actually answering different parts of the same question. 
Geneticists are answering the question, when did the first modern human beings who have left behind a continuing lineage and therefore can be called our direct ancestors arrive in India? While archaeologists are answering the question, when did the first modern humans arrive in India? And these two need not be the, need not be the same. Uh, and they answer it in this way because geneticists are deal working with genomes and archaeologists are working with the tools and other things ma made, either made or used by humans. Therefore, it is possible that both their answers are correct. Modern humans may have reached India as far back as 120,000 years ago, but they may have perished without leaving a lineage for, a, for any number of reasons. But modern humans who arrived around 65,000 years ago have left behind a lineage and maybe our direct ancestors. Uh, the fourth lucky circumstance was that I came to the discipline of population genetics last, after I had done a lot of work in every other discipline in understanding what they had to say. This is because only when I was quite some way into the work did I realize that actually some of the most interesting answers to the questions I was dealing with was coming from population genetics. This was lucky because by the time I was looking at population genetics uh, papers, it was possible to make the connections with the findings from other disciplines. And that brought far greater clarity to what happened in the distant past. But the fifth and most, uh, fifth and last circumstance was that population genetics as a discipline was itself going through a dramatic phase of uh, growth and uh, expansion with new methodologies and techniques improving the resolution of its analysis manifold. The ability that population geneticists acquired in the last few years to extract ancient DNA uh, from people who lived thousands or tens of thousands of years ago was the most consequential of the revolution it brought to our understanding of prehistory around the world. Uh, I will explain this briefly. Until it became possible to extract and sequence DNA from ancient individuals, population genetics where studies were based on analyzing the genomes of uh, currently living populations. And uh, such analysis does give you a very good idea of which population groups are connected to which other population groups uh, and how closely or how distantly. But this does not provide you any idea of uh, how that relationship came about. For example, a genetic uh, study published in uh, 2013 suggested that um, uh, North Indian populations were more, were more closely connected to West Eurasian populations, that is West Asia, Central Asia, uh, and Europe, than South Indian sphere. But that study could not really say how did that relationship come about. Did West Eurasians move to India, or did Indians move to uh, part, other parts of uh, Eurasia? This is the situation that changed dramatically uh, when ancient DNA arrived on the scene about five years ago. And this is how it made the difference. Assume that you have ancient DNA uh, from an archaeological site in, say, Delhi from different time periods. Uh, then let us say that you de find DNA from people who lived in Delhi 4,000 years ago. Uh, and that it does not have uh, a Central Asian ancestry. But the DNA from people who lived here 3,000 years ago do have such ancestry. It is then a clear conclusion that between two, these two periods, a new ancestry, a Central Asian ancestry, did move into Delhi. This is what has revolutionized our understanding of prehistory around the world. Because in the last... Uh, few years, hundreds and hundreds of ancient DNA samples have been analyzed, sequenced across the world. The revolution in prehistory that is going on today is not 
specifically about South Asia. It's just one part of a much greater revolution and understanding of prehistory that is going on around the world. For example, we now know that uh, Europe's demography went through two major changes just in the last 10,000 years. First, around uh, 9,000 years ago, the farmers from uh, what is today known as Turkey and earlier known as Anatolia moved into Europe, mixing with or replacing uh, the then existing hunter gatherers of Europe. And that was just the first one. Then again, about 5,000 years ago, pastoralists from uh, Central Asia moved into Europe, either mixing with or replacing the then existing farmers and also the remaining hunter gatherer groups in Europe. We know that in the US, after 16,000 years ago, uh, it was peopled by at least three migrations from Asia. Mind you, this is hundreds and thousands of years before Europeans ever landed there, uh, across the uh, Bering Straits from, from Alaska. The, we know that the East Asian populations underwent two, two churns uh, around 4,000 years ago or later, uh, both influenced by large-scale migrations from the Chinese heartland. Um, so, so, the, so this is the change that ancient DNA brought about. And in terms of my lucky circumstances, this is the last one. If this unique advancement in the science of population genetics happened just when I was looking at these issues, and uh, and without this happy circumstance, it is likely that I will still be working on the book. So this, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, though I had to stand at the right at the right place for a very long time. Um, so that brings us. We could, with the new understanding that ancient DNA has provided, we can now say that very broadly. Uh, even though migrations happen in all places during all times, there are four classes or types of migrations that really stand out. Uh, they, they stand out because they were global in nature and, and they left a major mark on uh, vast regions of the world. And equally importantly, they had global forces behind them, in the sense that when we look back at them, we can understand why those migrations happened when they did. So what are those four classes of migrations? The first major class of migration, or pre-migration uh, or, or migration event, and this was driven mostly by climatic factors, because that's what determined uh, when uh, modern human beings, or even mammals, or any animals moved from place to place. So the first major prehistoric migration began around 70,000 years ago when a group of migrants from Africa moved into the Arabian Peninsula, maybe no more than a few hundreds of people, and then went on to populate the rest of the known African world. The last major continent uh, that the descendants of these out-of-Africa migrants uh, populated was the Americas, and that's about 16,000 years ago. So between 70,000 years ago and 16,000 years ago, uh, a small band of Africans and their descendants more or less colonized the rest of the world for the modern humans. They reached India pretty soon after getting out of Africa, around 65,000 years ago, as we will see soon. So this first major prehistoric migration that was global in its impact is otherwise known as the out of Africa migration. The next point is equally important. Once much of the world was thus populated, during the, the, there's a glacial period followed, uh, starting around 29,000 years ago and ending around 14,000 years ago. Uh, during the glacial period, the world there, there's great level of aridity, which means uh, you know regions that had been lush and green turned deserts, and the number of habitable regions shrink and populations get separated. So during the, racial, during the glacial period that it intervened, many of the modern human population groups that were spreading around the world got separated from each other and started evolving around slightly different lines 
accumulating minor genetic differences. Once much of the world was populated, then during the following, uh, then our, and the, and the uh, glacial period ended, Th that set the stage for the beginning of the second uh, major prehistoric migrations. The world started warming up around 12,000 years ago, and pretty soon we can see modern human populations in many parts of the world, not one, experimenting with agriculture. Uh, not all those experiments were successful. Not all those successful were sustainable. And not all those experiments that were sustainable were very advantageous. We can say that modern human population groups who happened to be in regions where they could uh, domesticate and cultivate cereals were in a very advantageous positions, such as the Indians, the Chinese, the uh, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians. Those who had uh, in geographic locations that led them to, led them to uh, domesticate uh, tubers or yams or bananas as in the Pacific Islands uh, or in many Southeast Asian places. In some of these areas, ag uh, uh, farming or agriculture may have even started earlier than Mesopotamia, for example, recent research, research shows. So, but that did not give the productivity, and we, we did not see that leading on to a major uh, uh, expansion of agriculture and a major change in circumstance. But those who did take to agriculture, the result uh, to cereal cultivation, uh, the results were dramatic. There was a boom in uh, population, and a boom in because people settled down, and their populations increased dramatically compared to the small growth that hunter-gatherer populations are used to. And it's that population boom that leads on to mass migrations. So the second major migrations happened after many population groups in many parts of the world, not, at, not always at the same time, uh, took to agriculture, leading to a massive expansion of population and resulting in mass migrations. So this is the second class of uh, migrations. The third class of migrations happened after some modern po human population groups mastered the art of metallurgy, making bronze, arms, and also the art of uh, you know, mastery over horses, uh, which, uh, all of which made them uh, very efficient, uh, and much more mobile, and ready for war. This set of migrations also affected a very large part of Eurasia, from the farthest reaches of Europe, to West Asia, to South Asia, to China. One could perhaps call them the Bronze Age migrations. These three classes of migrations that I just described happened uh, by and large in the prehistoric period, which is prehistoric period means uh, the periods before writing was invented uh, in, mo in many parts of the world. But the fourth major class of migrations driven by historic forces happened in the last few centuries, and we all know about them very well. This happened when modern human population groups figured out how to cross the oceans, invented steamships, and figured out how to sail around the world quickly and make colonies. This was also global in its nature, and changed the demography in some parts of the world in a major manner, and in other parts in a minor manner. It is for future historians to decide, discuss, whether we are currently living through a fifth major mass migration uh, driven by differential rates in population growth and differences in GDP per capita or prosperity. Uh, now, to come to the question of India, uh, which of these migrations shaped India? We already know that the last migration that we discussed, the colonial migrations, did not leave any, any, any noticeable mark on Indian demography because the migrants were far too few in relation to the size of the existing population. Um, we already know, uh, so the migrations that shaped India are actually the other three. Uh, out of Africa migrants who arrived 65,000 years ago who still form 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of most Indian population groups. We'll come to this again later. The second 
uh, agri uh, major uh, uh, migration was a Neolithic or farming migration, and it came from uh, from the Zagros region, from West Asia, from the Zagros region of today's Iran. We'll talk about it later, uh, more again. This is about 9,000 years ago. The third migration happened from East Asia, again a farming-related migration uh, that uh, reached Eastern India, and uh, we will talk about it again 4,000 years ago. The last major migration that shaped Indian population arrived uh, between 4,000 and 3,000 years ago from uh, Eurasian steppe, which we will talk again talk about it in detail later. So these are the four migrations uh, out of the uh, four migrations that shaped Indian population. There are many migrations that happened after this that you yourself we, are, we all know the Huns, the Shakas, the Sky. You know, uh, there's a long list of them. Some of them may have made a large impact on our culture, but demographically speaking, uh, they left a little mark on our demography. These are the four, four migrations, the four major components of what we are. So in essence, yeah. if you want to understand India's demography as it stands today, we need to grasp the nature of the three classes of major prehistoric migrations that reached India and what happened after they arrived. This is where a multidisciplinary approach is useful. This is where other disciplines come into the picture very strongly. Because population genetics can tell you which populations are related to which other populations. and can also tell you who moved where to make those relationships happen. Uh, but the resolution of these findings and the explanatory power increases dramatically when they gel with findings from other disciplines uh, that have looked at the same issues. The question is, in the case of India uh, and South Asian history, is there such an interlocking, a meshing in that provides us with greater explanatory power for the genetic findings of recent times? The answer is yes, there is. And this does increase the explanatory power of the genetic findings manifold. I will now go into five questions that have now been answered and show how interlocking evidence from multiple disciplines is making our prehistory clear. These are the five questions. Who were the first Indians and where are they now? Who were the Harappans, the question on which I start the uh, book, the project, and where are they now? Who are the idea? Who are the Dravidians? And when and why did the caste system begin? These are all, as you can see, foundational questions about Indian population formation. And none of, most of them could not have been answerable just six years ago. Definitely not when I started on the book. That's the amount of change that has happened in the last few years. Not just in India, was repeating all over the world. So who were the first, Indi first Indians? Genetics has a very clear answer, which we discussed. All modern humans outside of Africa are descendants of a small group of Africans who moved into Asia around 70,000 years ago and then spread across the world. How do the geneticists know this? How do we know this? What's the proof? Because looking into the genomes of all living populations outside Africa, geneticists can see that they all can trace their ancestry back to a small subsection of the African population that existed around 70,000 years ago. So whether we are talking about the first Indians, first Europeans, first Chinese, first Australians, first Japanese, or first, American, first Americans, they were all descendants of the small group of out of Africa migrants who, who reached different parts of the world at different times. But genetics cannot tell us about when exactly they reached India or about the process of settlement in the continent, in the subcontinent. For that, we need to take the help of archaeology. It's from archaeology that we know that the earliest modern humans were in India at least by 65,000 years ago. This is because we know from fossils and tools that the earliest migrating modern humans left behind that they were in Australia by at least 59,000 years ago and in Southeast Asia by at least 63,000 years ago. So it's a reasonable assumption that they were in India at least by 65,000 years ago because the 
most likely route that they would they would have taken would have involved them going through South East, South Asia into Southeast Asia and ultimately Australia. But it is not just when they reached India, but how they settled uh, in the subcontinent that is also being revealed by archaeology. For example, it is archaeology that tells us that when the first Indians arrived in the subcontinent, they were not reaching an empty land without any competition. When they reached India, they were faced with an existing robust population of other homo species who had been here for at least 1.5 million years. Modern humans arose only uh, 300,000 years ago. So we are saying for five times as long, other homo species have been present in India, which we know from the tools that they have left behind. The oldest tool that we have found is from Atirampakam near Chennai, which is about 1.5 million years ago. So by the time modern humans reached here, they were not coming into an empty land. They were coming into a land which was already heavily populated and from the uh, evidence of stone tools, more especially in the central and southern India or the peninsular India, where this presence was the strongest. Uh, we often assumed earlier that modern humans were somehow very superior to the other homo species. We now know that this is just conceit. Modern humans were mostly indistinguishable from other homo species for much of the period that uh, all, all of them shared the earth. Uh, we can't distinguish what type of tools one made from the other. And many of the other homo species had brains larger than ours. So the assumption that modern humans were somehow far superior to the other is, is conceit. It takes only much, much later, uh, which will come to later, when, uh, some, uh, when the kind of tools that they made differs. So it, so it is, archaeologists say that it is highly unlikely that modern humans, when they reached here, settled in the whole land. They are very likely to have uh, stayed away from the, from the way of the existing and robust population of other homo species. Uh, they have a name for this uh, settlement, which is Indian stage dispersal, which is, which is to say that they reached different parts of India at different points of time. Um, they also say it is likely that the uh, that the modern humans moved, uh, mini, you know, stayed in the sub-Himalayan region, staying out of the peninsula region, and it's possible that their descendants then went across to East Asia, Australia, etc., uh, through the sub-Himalayan route. But it's also possible that another branch of the same uh, out of Africa migration came through the western coast, went to Sri Lanka, and then up the eastern coast and went across to Southeast Asia, uh, or both these are possible, in both cases staying out of the heartland of peninsular India. But is there a time, because we do know that the other homo species do go ex uh, did go extinct, we don't know exactly when, but they did go extinct. So at what point of time can we say the modern humans were in control or dominant in the Indian subcontinent? Uh, we, have a, uh, we do have an idea, that's around 35,000 years ago or about 30,000 years after they reached India. What happens around 35,000 years ago? Two, three things happened together. Uh, 35,000 years ago, the world climate is again slowly moving into the gla glacial period. And, uh, and so the, the, the weather is deteriorating, there are less habitable areas. This is also the time when we see suddenly a profusion of uh, a new kind of tools uh, which are microlithic tools. These are s not more than a few centimeters long, and they are usually hafted onto bone or, 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 uh, or wood and used as spears, arrows, etc., lethal armory. So around 35,000 years ago, we see modern humans, and they are the, they are mod this, is, this is one tool that the modern humans are associated with, moving into and using far more effectively uh, new uh, kind of tools which are microlithic tools. We can see that evidence on the archaeological record. Third, we can also see from the genetic evidence that uh, modern human populations start rapidly increasing. So wha wha how would you put all these things together? As the climate starts deteriorating and there is competition for uh, habitable areas, modern humans start using better technology and probably start moving into areas that they had stayed out of earlier and they are successful. Otherwise, their population wouldn't be uh, exploding like it did. So by around 35,000 years ago, you can safely assume 
that modern humans were in control of much of the subcontinent and how soon it took for the uh, other homo species to go extinct we don't know we know that in europe uh, they went extinct around 40000 years ago uh, a few thousand years after modern humans reached there uh, so that's the Uh, one more interesting thing, According the scientists today believe that around 2,000 years ago, uh, India was, uh, was the, the center of modern human population. So next time you hear that, you know, South Asia or India, we are a very large country with a very large population, we should know that this is nothing new, that this is purely a record that we have been uh, keeping up for almost for tens of thousands of years. It looks like this has been a very, very hospitable region uh, for the homo lineage, not just modern humans, but also for other <laughs> homo species. This is a first a sample home of the first Indians. If you haven't been to Bhimbhadka in Madhya Pradesh, please uh, put it on your visiting list. It's a fascinating site. This is a rock shelter that uh, has been in occupation for 100,000 years. Since modern humans only reached around 65,000 years ago, which this means this has been in occupation long before that by, by, by other homo species. Pardon? Bhimbhadka in Madhya Pradesh. Bhimbhadka. So, Bhimbhadka. Yeah, fascinating site. And this. Rock, <laughs> pardon? Yeah, o of course, yeah. Uh, I think the, the rock shelters are far more inviting in many of the modern. Um, residences built by the richest people in India. Uh, now that brings us to the... Uh, now before I finish that, as I said earlier, geneticists now also know that 50 to 60 percent of the... 65 percent of the ancestry of most population groups in India comes from the first Indians. Uh, this, is, this is new. This is not something we knew earlier. Because we remember, we used to ask, where are the first Indians? Where, where can we find them? Do we have to go to Andamans? The answer today is that you have to only look in the mirror or look around. The, the, the ancestry of the first Indians is the most dominant ancestry of Indian population groups. It is true that Andam Andamanese have mixed less with later migrations that came. To that extent, they are uh, they're different. But really, the ancestry of the first Indians, if you want to see, you only have to look into the mirror or look around. Uh, so now we won't go on to the second question. Uh, who were the Harappans? Now this was the question that started me. This was the question that started me on this whole project six years ago. And after visiting many Harappan sites, reading dozens of research reports that initially made no sense to me, and meeting over 30 academics and scientists in different fields, what became clear was that one cannot answer the question about the Harappans, who were the Harappans, without answering the question, who were the first farmers? Because it was clear from the archaeological record that the Harappan civilization is a natural and slow outgrowth of the, of the uh, agricultural revolution that happened in northwestern India. So the question of who were the Harappans is absolutely the same as who were the first farmers. Evidence for the first agricultural settlement uh, in the subcontinent comes from a village that is today called Mehargar in Pakistan's Baluchistan province. And at its earliest levels, we find a population that, that was beginning to cultivate wheat and barley and was domesticating animals. In the archaeological record, we can see the agricultural revolution spreading from Balochistan to Sindh to Punjab to Haryana and across an entire region of northwestern India, with villages slowly becoming fortified, developing into towns, and then finally the emergence of the Harappan cities and civilization. So who were these people starting up agriculture in the subcontinent and then going on to create the Harappan civilization? Genetic studies based on ancient DNA recovered from the mature Harappan period, that's from around 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE answered this question last year. The Harappans, it is now clear, were an admixed population of first Indians and West Asian agriculturists 
uh, from the Zagros mountain region of uh, what is today Iran, uh, which is on the eastern borders of uh, what is known as the Fertile Crescent region, one of the earliest regions in the world to experience the agricultural revolution. But the full story, this is interesting, this is also the answer, but if you really want to know the full story, you need to bring archaeology in. And the thing to keep in mind, which is interesting, is that the genetic research that confirmed the link between the Zagros region and the Harappans was based on ancient DNA recovered from an archaeological site called Ganjdare in the central Zagros region. This was ancient DNA that's going back to 8000 BCE or so. This is the, uh, the Ganj Dare is the earliest site with the evidence of God domestication anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. More important, this is the site that has been compared with Mehergar by the archaeologists, the French archaeologists who excavated Mehergar and uh, you know f f the uh, in the 1980s. His name is uh, Jean Franchot Jarich, uh, who excavated Mehergar in the 1980s. In an article written in 2006, a dozen years before the genetic evidence linked Ganj Dare to northwestern India, this is what he had to say. The full setting of the farming economy at Mehargar displays evident similarities with what had been noticed in case of the early Neolithic settlements in the hilly regions forming the eastern border of Mesopotamia. Here he's specifically talking about the sites such as Ganj Dari. So what exactly are these evident similarities? Same kinds of quadrangular houses built with narrow bricks about 60 centimeters long with finger marks for keying in uh, mortar. Then there are circular fire pits with burned uh, pebbles suggesting usage of the heated stones for cooking bread which is exactly the same way uh, that co bread is cooked in Baluchistan even today. Traces of red paint on the walls of the structures, polished stone axes made in black diorite, skeletons and burials placed in similar positions, baskets coated with bitumen, oblong shaped cakes of red ochre, similar styles of making early ceramics. The list is, 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 is very, very long, too long to say. So it is no wonder that uh, Jairus describes the two, two, two cultures, the, the two early farming cultures in the two regions uh, as a cultural continuum. One of the striking images to emerge from the excavation at Mehergar were a few graves at the earliest levels that held the skeletons of five young women who had died and uh, they were buried with young goats or kids placed around their legs in a semicircle. Evidently, goats were very dear uh, to the Mahagarians, which is to be seen in the context of Ganj Dare being the earliest proven site for goat domestication. There is no surprise then that Jairid uses the phrase cultural continuum to describe the relationship between the two regions. The archaeological evidence thus puts flesh and blood on the story that DNA tells. Uh, one would think it is DNA that puts flesh and blood, but it is actually archaeology. It tells us of a gro group of modern humans pioneering animal domestication in the Zagros region and migrating probably with their goats and sheep to newer areas as their population expands. Some of them reach Mehargarh and mix with the first Indians who were perhaps already domesticating their own things like uh, the hump cattle or the zebu cattle or the buffaloes. We know for a fact that both these were domesticated in India. So it's possible that uh, some of these new arrivals perhaps remain as herders today. Some of those who came from uh, Zagros may have remained as herders today, but some settled down with the first Indians, a mixed population that went on to spark an agricultural revolution uh, in the northwestern India and later on that foundation create the Harappan civilization. So now we now know a pretty clear answer of who were the Harappans. They were a mixed population of first Indians and West Asians. But a multi multidisciplinary approach has more goodies to offer. And this time we turn to linguistics to try and figure out what language the Harappans may have spoken. Uh, the earliest civilization 
uh, or kingdom to arise in the Zagros region was called Elam and it came into being sometime around 2700 BCE, about 4700 years ago. The language spoken by its people, which went extinct more than 2000 years ago, uh, the last um, you know, the written records are only from around 450 BCE. Uh, so Elam, it, it was a very interesting kind of civilization or kingdom. They were very persistent. So now and then they will go, de go defeated and disappear from records, but they will again come back, the Elam, Elamite civilization. And uh, the language they spoke was called Elamite. We know that genetics and archaeology suggest a migration from this region uh, thousands of years before Elam civilization itself arose. So the migrants could not have been uh, could not have been products of the urban uh, Elam civilization, but people from a period much par much prior to that, who might have spoken a language prior to Elamite, which we could call Proto Elamite. If the migrants from Zagros brought a proto elamite language with them, that language could have become at least one of the main languages of the Harappan civilization, if not the main one. Considering how large and long-lasting the Harappan civilization was, 700 years in its mature phase alone, their language should also have left a mark, left a mark on India. Is there such a mark? There is. Uh, Long before the Harappan civilization was discovered, it was discovered in the 1920s, barely, uh, barely a century ago. We'd, after, before this, there was no idea in anyone's mind that such, there was such a thing as Harappan civilization. So long before the Harappan civilization was discovered, linguists working on Dravidian languages were suggesting a connection between Elamite and Dravidian. The Harappan civilization was discovered in the 1920s but more than six decades earlier in 1853, Edwin Norris, one of the scholars who helped decipher the well-known Behustun inscription of the Achaemenid emperor Darius, pointed out that the Elamite script worked on the same principles as Tamil. Three years later, in 1856, Robert Caldwell, who wrote the first grammar of the Dravidian family of languages, put forward Elamite as the first suggested affiliation for Tamil and discussed the connection between the two at length. But the real and substantive work on this was done by linguist uh, Dr. David W. McAlpin, who wrote a very impactful paper in 1981 titled proto elamo dravidian The Evidence and Implications. And just six years earlier, and j just, just six years ago, in 2013, McAlpin and another very well-known linguist who is an expert in both Dravidian languages and Indo-European languages, Professor Franklin T. Southworth, they co-authored a paper that took these arguments forward. It was titled South Asia Dravidian Linguistic History and concluded that older Elamite resembles Proto-Dravidian. This is what they said in their paper from 2013. Thus, we may posit as a starting point that the Proto-Dravidian community probably moved from somewhere in the south of present-day Iran. What is noteworthy is that this paper came out a, five, a full five years before the new ancient DNA evidence emerged, mm -hmm. suggesting migration from the Sagros region to northwestern India. So what we are seeing is that three very different disciplines, archaeology, genetics, and linguistics, arrive at the same conclusion independently, without relying on each other. So even though the Harappan script has not yet been deciphered, in the interlocking evidence of archaeology, linguistics, and genetics suggests that a Proto-Dravidian language was spoken in the Harappan civilization. There is also another equally striking evidence that suggests this. Archaeologists have long known that there are strong links between the Mesopotamian civilization and the Harappan civilization throughout its mature phase. Uh, there were trade links, the Harappans were even involved in some of the internecine warfare in Mesopotamia. In fact, the archaeological records of Mesopotamia show evidence of the trade links between, this West between the West Asian civilization and the Harappans. It is also known that one of the things that Mesopotamia got from the Harappans was sesame. 
And the striking finding is that the word for sesame in Dravidian languages and in the then language of Mesopotamia, Akkadian, is the same, Erlu. That's the same word in both languages. Just as we saw in the case of the uh, first Indians, in the case of the Harappans too, other disciplines do not merely support the conclusions that population genetics has arrived at recently. They in fact expand the explanatory power of these findings manifold. Genetics alone would not have been able to provide us the full picture, but in combination with other disciplines, we can get the resolution we need. Uh, before we move on, just a few pictures of this. This is the most stunning Harappan site, of course, Mahonjadaro in Sindh. Uh, if you haven't been to the Holavira, again, a pl must see place to visit just to just to know the the scale of the size. It's it's touching. It moves you to be there. It's two, built two, uh, 4,500 to 4,600 years ago. Just the scale of the size of the ambition of what was built. To see something similar next, after the Harappan civilization went to ruins, you had to wait more than a thousand years until the Amaurians came along to see something of this, 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 this ambition and scale. This is Tholavira. That's a, a large storage tank which they had. They had absolutely wonderful, stunning water conservation techniques. It was th th that the, uh, to the right side is, uh, is one of the main uh, pathways, the main roads in the, Harip in the Tholavira city. It's, uh, uh, it's a city of, there's nothing much archaeologically to see in Rakhikadi. This is just the village as it is today. So we now move on uh, to the next question. Uh, uh, who are the area? Uh, the interesting thing, uh, yeah. As we have seen in other cases, it is population genetics using ancient DNA that has proved the case of a mi for a migration from the Central Asian steppe into South Asia between 2000 BCE and 1000 BCE. It was a paper titled Genomic Formation in South and Central Asia, co-authored by 92 leading scientists from across disciplines and from across the world, including India, that was published just last year that put out the case of prehistoric steppe migrations into India. It said that until around 2100 BCE, there is no evidence of a Central Asian steppe ancestry in the Indus periphery or in the region surrounding it such as the Bactria, Marciana, uh, archaeological complex, or BMAC, a well-known civilization that the Harappans were in, were in regular contact with. But after that period, we begin to see evidence of such ancestry in these regions. The study said that there was a southward migration of pastoralists from the Kazakh steppe, first towards the central, central, southern Central Asian regions, such as Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, after 2100 BCE and then towards South Asia through the second millennium BCE, that is between 2000 and 1000 BCE. But how do we know that this migration brought Indo-European languages to India or that they called themselves Aria? There are two kinds of evidence that genetics itself provides. One, there are elevated levels of steppe ancestry the, the same report uh, 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 says, elevated levels of steppe ancestry among the traditional custodians of Sanskrit in India today, in particular the Brahmins of Uttar Pradesh. This suggests a link, link between the language Sanskrit and the migration of steppe pastoralists. The second kind of genetic evidence based on ancient DNA shows that steppe pastoralists from Central Asia moved into Europe about a thousand years before they moved into India. This gels well with the observed geographic spread of Indo-European languages from the westernmost parts of Europe to the easternmost part, which is India. There is also one more piece of evidence that proves the case. Here it is. India is the easternmost limit of the Indo-European language family spread. There are no large Indo-European language speaking communities to the east of India. 40% of the world's population today speak an Indo-European language, such as English, Hindi, Spanish, Portuguese, Iranian, Russian, or German. Two-thirds of Indians speak an Indo-European language, from Hindi to Bengali, 
to Punjabi to Marathi. So how did this particular language family become the dominant family in India? There are only two options. And uh, either it spread from here to the rest of the world, or it spread to here from the rest of the world. And this same logic applies to other countries speaking Indo-European language or any other language as well. It either spread from there to the rest of the world, or it spread there from elsewhere. Now, if the language spread from India to the rest of the world, then one would expect to see a fair sprinkling of the genetic signature of the first Indians, all the way from India to Eastern Europe to Western Europe and Iceland. Because remember that first, for, uh, the first Indians have been uh, are present are, are, is the dominant ancestry of India. They are present in all regions. Most population groups are 50 to 60 percent uh, of uh, uh, you know it belongs to the first Indian ancestry. So if there was a migration from India to the rest of the world, we should see a fair sprinkling of the first Indian ancestry across the world. But is there such a signature? No. The first Indian ancestry today has no close relatives anywhere else in the world. South Asia is the only place you will find it. Of course, the, the, the people who went down to Southeast Asia and, and Australia about f th tens of thousands of years ago, we can't call them close relatives anymore because that separation happened tens of 60,000, 55,000 years ago. The, the interesting thing is there is one exception to this rule that says uh, South A First Indians have no ancestry, no relatives outside of India. There is one exception. And that exception is the Roma, or who the population that was earlier called the Gypsies, who are spread across the, the, the millions of them who are both in Europe and in Greece, now in, I mean, the Americas as well. They are a nomadic uh, group. And uh, we, we genetic studies have confirmed time and again, and everyone knows, that they came from a, a single ethnic group that left northwestern India about 1,500 years ago from regions such as Punjab, Sindh, Rajasthan, Haryana, Gujarat. Some 1,500 years ago, they left, and that's the Roma. Uh, they could not have spread Indo-European languages because Indo-European languages were spread across the region far, far, uh, far earlier than 1,500 years ago. So as they migrated west, did the Roma carry the genetic signature of the first Indians? Yes, they did. Genetic studies say that Roma carry a, the mtDNA haplogroups uh, or the DNA signature that captures descent through the maternal line that are identified with the first Indian ancestry. Uh, this is a, these are recent research reports that make this link. In other words, when there was an actual migration from the Indian subcontinent towards the west and all the way to Europe, a genetic signature of the first Indians indeed went with them. That there is no other evidence of such a signature across this vast region is a strong suggestion that Indo-European languages did not spread from India to the rest of the world. One of the curious facts about Indian prehistory has been that after the decline of the Harappan civilization due to a long drought, not because of an invasion, that this we know now, uh, that a long drought that affected many civilizations at the same time, we do not see cities in the region, in India, for over a thousand years, or nearly as much as that. Until the Mauryas rise to power in the region of eastern India, known as Magadha, or a slightly earlier. We now know that this isn't really surprising. Since settlements dwindled, and in some cases disappeared, even in Europe, when the steppe pastoralists moved in there, uh, as anthropologists, as a new mobile pastoral lifestyle became the new norm. Anthropologist David W. Anthony has also recorded similarities between the rituals uncovered uh, during excavations at the Russian archaeological sites of Sintashta and Arkham and those described in the Rig Veda. The predominance of the horse in the excavated cultures of Central Asia, uh, Central Asian pastoralists, and the Vedic liturgy also go to substantiate the interlinkages between population genetics, archaeology, and linguist uh, linguistics and philology in the matter of the migration of Indo-European language-speaking people who called themselves Arya into South Asia between 2000 and 1000 BCE. That brings us to the next question, where a multidisciplinary approach uh, proves, proves to be even more productive. And that is, who are the Dravidians? 
a caveat is in order here before we proceed further. Both Dravidian and Aryan are descriptors of language communities, not races. Arya is the self-description of those who speak Indo-Europe, Indo-Aryan languages, uh, a subset of the Indo-European language family. The Dravidians, similarly, are those who speak one of the Dravidian languages, a family of languages that doesn't exist today outside of South Asia and is mostly spoken in South India. So who are, the, who are these Dravidian language speakers and how did they come to be distributed as they are? The old version of our prehistory says that when the Arya arrived in northwest India, in northern India, they destroyed the Harappan civilization and the Harappans moved down south, taking the Dravidian language with them. But we now know from multiple studies that the Harappan civilization declined due to a long drought that affected other civilizations at the same time as well. And genetic studies have now shown that the Harappans, the mixed population of first Indians and West Asians, as you remember, are the ancestors of both North Indians and South Indians. Why? Because when their civilization declined, they moved east towards what is North India and moved south towards what is South India. In the north, they mixed with the later incoming uh, migrants, the area, and in the south, they mixed with the existing uh, first Indians. In other words, both North Indians and South Indians today carry the ancestry of the Harappans. Uh, in North India, the dominance of the incoming Aryans caused the language shift among the population uh, from pre-Aryan or Dravidian languages to Indo-European languages, while Dravidian languages thrived in the South in the, abs in, in, in the absence of such dominance. In this story, though, there is a problem. In this telling of the story, too, there is a problem. Uh, Dravidian language in this telling of the story reach, uh, 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 reach uh, South India sometime after the decline of the Harappan civilization, which is around 1900 BCE. The problem with this is that ling linguistic studies have repeatedly shown, uh, based on Dravidian languages, that, they, uh, that their origin and diversification date back to around 4,500 years ago, or to about 2,500 BCE, not after 1900 BCE. And this finding of the, of the growth and of, of the Vedian languages fits in well with the spread of agriculture because as we have seen, it's when agriculture spreads that very often, very often, that language also spreads. So if you want to understand the spread of languages, it's, it's in, it, it is useful to look at, so when did agriculture spread? Because both often go hand in hand. So is it possible that Dravidian languages reached uh, uh, South India much before the Harappan civilization began declining? Yes, there is. Uh, it's a long, it's a, uh, 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 it's good to go stage by stage. Archaeobotanist, according to archaeobotanist Dorian Q. Fuller, people in peninsular India had taken to cultivating two kinds of millets and two kinds of pulses sometime after 3000 BC. This is the beginning of agriculture. And uh, um, as you can see, this is the first time these are being domesticated. These pulses and millets are being, pulses, uh, being domesticated anywhere in the world. So it's, it's a South India is a domestication center, even though at a later stage than in northwestern India. So around 3000 BC, the basic, this is, they have a basic crop package Ba uh, of millets and pulses, uh, like wheat and barley in northwestern India. They had domesticated these millets and pulses from locally available wild varieties. But a full agricultural package requires not just domesticated plants, but also domesticated animals. It's only then that the agricultural transition gathers momentum. You need a package of uh, domesticated plants and a package of domesticated animals. And around 2800 BCE, we see the first evidence of domesticated cattle, goat, and sheep in northern Karnataka. In a 2006 paper, Fuller laid out the case for why these domesticated animals, Fuller is, uh, is, is, is the archaeologist who devoted a whole uh, amount of time to, uh, uh, to, uh, to agriculture uh, in the Indian subcontinent, especially the south. In a 2006 paper, Fuller laid out the case for why these domesticated animals were introduced into the south from the north. 
the earliest evidence for the integration of of the agricultural package with these domesticated animals uh, int introduced from the north come from what are called ash mounds uh, or large mounds of ash formed by the burning of cow dung dated from around 2200 BCE. Fuller considers the ash mound tradition to be the outcome of the interaction between cultivators and immigrant pastoralists. Now comes the question, who could these immigrant pastoralists be? Uh, as we saw earlier, those who arrived from in northwestern India from the Zagros region around 9,000 years ago were herders. While some of them may have settled down as farmers, creating the agricultural revolution and then the Harap and civilization, others may have remained herders to this day. Uh, for example, we know that the Brahui, in, uh, who speak in the uh, in related language, are still heard, uh, many of them are still herders. So there is a possibility that it is some of these herders who may have brought cattle and goat, goat herding to South India, and they would have been the first to bring a Dravidian language here too. A look at the, a look at the climatic map of India will show that there is a savanna zone, uh, 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 an expanse covered in grasses that runs from Gujarat and Rajasthan all the way through central Deccan and all the way down to South India along the western side of the peninsula. So this would have been a perfect route for the Dravidian language speaking uh, herders to take as they expanded their range. In other words, migrant Dravidian language speakers could have been a crucial part of the, agri of the uh, agricultural expansion in southern India and consequently the language expansion of Dravidian languages as well. The arrival of the Harappans, urbanites, almost a thousand years later, after their civilization declined, uh, would have built on an existing foundation of Dravidian languages present in South India. But this is a working hypothesis yet and uh, will need confirmation from further research, especially into the linguistic chronology of Dravidian languages in tandem with what the archaeological record says about the expansion of the southern Neolithic complex. That brings us to the last question, where a multidisciplinary approach can solve probably the most important and the biggest mystery of Indian society. How did and why did the caste system begin? As we have seen earlier, it is genetic evidence that has answered the question with much greater clarity than what we had earlier. But the answer fits in well with existing knowledge from linguistic, philological and archaeological sources. Let me explain. A 2013 paper uh, titled Genetic Evidence for Recent Population Mixture in India said that around 100 CE, India experienced a demographic transition from a region in which population mixing was common to a region in which such mixing became rare due to a shift to endogamy or the practice of marrying within one's own community. In the 2000 years before that, from around 2200 BCE to 100 BCE, there was mixing of the kind that had never been seen before or after. To put this in context, Context, remember that by around 2000 BCE, all the four uh, major components of Indian population are in. The out of Africa migrants have been in for very long. The West Asian migrants have been in and have built the Harappan civilization. The East Asian migrants are also in by around uh, uh, 2000 uh, BCE. And the Central Asian steppe pastors are also in around that time. So, and what we see during the next, after this, these elements are already in, what we see during the next 2,000 years is mixing between these populations, these four groups, in a, man, in a way that no Indian population group is left untouched. If you today analyze the DNA of any Indian population group, no matter in how remote a region, you will find that it carries mixed ancestry of in varying proportions. The only population group that ex escaped this mixing was the Andaman Islanders, and, and that only because they were cut off from the mainland physically.
But what is remarkable is that this mixing came to an end sometime around 100 CE when in endogamy took hold. Since endogamy is a distinguishing feature of the caste system, we can surmise that this is the time around when caste system fell around the ankles of the Indian society. In other words, caste system did not begin with the arrival of the Arya, as, is co as was commonly believed. Uh, it began almost 2,000 years later. One way to grasp this new information is to look at the caste system not as an eternal religious command, but as a political development that happened around 180, 100 CE. The idea of endogamy or racial purity may have been present among a small sub subset of the Indian population before 100 CE, but after that period, that sentiment or approach to life uh, that was practiced by a small group became the dominant social practice in the subcontinent. We do not as yet know what precise political developments led to this, but the new knowledge that the caste system did not begin with the area, area migration, does find support in ancient texts. The earliest Veda, the Rig Veda, doesn't mention the caste system, and the Rig Vedic verse called the Purusha Sukta, that is often used to justify the caste system, appears in Mandala 10, which was composed much later than the rest of the text, and most experts even then considered it to be a later interpolation to provide post facto justification for caste segregation. Many of the sages mentioned in the Rig Veda are born of people who would, under the caste system, be seen as lower castes. As historian Romila Thapa has noted in her book, Indian Cultures as Heritage, it is worth noting that when Magasthenes, the Greek visitor, writes about the Mauryan India in the, in the late 4th century BCE, there is only a garbled description of what might have been a vague reference to ca caste and no hint of anything like an untouchable category. As I have mentioned earlier, when Fahin visits in the 4th century uh, AD, he describes how untouchables have to strike a clapper on entering the town to indicate their presence so that others can move away. This is in the so-called golden age of the Guptas, the presence of the untouchable is heavily marked and emphatically defined. She also writes, the exclusion of the Avarna took the form of arguing that some communities were asprishya or untouchable, a term that came into use at this time. This dates the early to mid centuries of the first millennium AD. So, it's also important to remember that many of the Dharma Shastra that codified the caste system, including the well-known Manusmriti or Manava Dharma Shastra, was written only in the second or third century CE. So the common idea that Buddhism and Jainism were a full-fledged revolt against the settled caste system is a misunderstanding that needs to be corrected. They are better seen as a voice of opposition to an incipient ideology of hierarchy, separateness and purity uh, that was uh, taking shape and would only much later crystallize into the caste system that we are familiar with. So in short, the ancient texts are in conformity with the genetic finding that the caste system fell in place only in the early centuries of the common era. But why did it fall in place around that time? Here we need to uh, bring in linguistics and philology, the study of ancient texts that can perhaps provide uh, uh, tentative answers. <laughs> the linguistic answer comes from Frank, Professor Sra Franklin C. Southworth's work, which we have seen earlier. Uh, his work is called The Linguistic Archaeology of South Asia, uh, and it builds on the earlier work of Sir George Grierson, compiler of the first linguistic survey of India. Southworth says, indo aryan languages can be divided into two social linguistic groups that are different. Uh, th they both uh, are two different groups which, which have similar characteristics within their group, but which differ from the other group. One of them being the inner or north central group, and the other being the outer or uh, southwestern eastern group. The north central group includes Hindi, Punjabi, Rajasthani, Bundeli, and Pahari, while the southwestern eastern group includes Bangla, Bihari, Oriya, Marathi, and Konkani. Such a di division can be accounted for 
by for by differing migration histories uh, say southwards with one migration bringing one group of area into the punjab and then the and then the ganga and on the other hand another migration bringing another group of area down the indus to deccan and then further east we already know from ancient texts that there were multiple groups of area who were often at conflict with each other therefore the common perception that there was a monolithic group of area migrants who came to india and imposed a uniform social system over south asia is at odds with facts it would be more realistic to assume that there were different area groups with differing social attitudes and approaches uh, to mixing uh, use of language and ideas of hierarchy some groups belonging to the inner group or aryavarta to use a, a geographical approximation were highly orthodox in their social relations and perhaps language use and genetically mixed less with the already settled population that they came across uh, which is also visible from recent genetic results uh, while the outer group or the magadha group to use a geographical approximation uh, were much less rigid and mixed more with the settled populations this difference in approach is also reflected in the text and in the particular disdain with which aryavarta refers to magadha uh, people of both areas belong to the arya community they both speak into europe in 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 indo aryan languages but those of aryavarta regarded those of magadha as mlechas or brab or barbarians as noted by professor johannes bronkhurst in his book greater magadha the grammarian patanjali asks an interesting question and then answers it himself in his commentary mahabhasya written around 150 bce which is the land of the area it is here yeah, then he answers it is the region to the east where the saraswati disappears west of the kalaka forest south of the himalayas and north of the pariyatra mountains the kalaka forest is traditionally assumed to be near the confluence of the ganga and the yamuna and the pariyatra mountains to be the vindhyas since many other records mention aryavarta as a land between the ganga and the yamuna so this pass and this passage occurs virtually identical form in many other texts to quote bronkhorst the region east of the confluence of the ganga and yamuna was not considered brahmanical territory at the time of patanjali this does not exclude that there were brahmins living there rather it suggests that the brahmins living in it did not receive the esteem uh, which they deemed themselves entitled to in patanjali's aryavarta on the other hand we may assume that they did receive this esteem at least to some extent the interesting thing to note is that this view of regions to the east of the confluence of the ganga and yamuna especially magadha region as mlechadesha changed just a few centuries later in the manava dharma shastra shastra or, or manusmriti written some time before the 3rd century ce uh, aryavarta was redefined as ranging from c to c to quote the land between the same mountain ranges that is the himalaya and vindhya extending from the eastern to the western sea is what the wise call the aryavarta in other words between the composition of mahabhasya in 150 ce and manava dharma shastra sometime in the 3rd century ce the political situation had changed enough for aryavarta to claim magadha as its own and not something in opposition to what it was in other words the orthodox view of the society the orthodox view of how a society ought to be organized and governed had won a victory over the more open minded and free willing uh, world view of magadha the story of how this precisely this happened is yet to be written and will require a lot more research all these are to be uh, uh, the pointers to what wh- how to look at beginning to understand what happened in 100 ce we do not yet know what happened this requires far greater research and these are merely pointers what we do know for certain unlike what we just went through is that the caste system has been in practice for 2000 years has left a major mark on indian society uh, that we can measure for example 
the genetic difference between people in a single Indian village is two to three times that between North Europeans and South Europeans. That's stunning. So that's what the caste system has done. It has divided our population and increased the differences between them. To quote genetic scientist David Reich, who has led the research based on ancient DNA across the world, people tend to think India, with its more than 1.3 billion population, as having a tremendously large population. And indeed, many Indians as well as foreigners see it this way. But genetically, this is an incorrect way to view the situation. The Han Chinese are, truly, are a truly large population. They have been mixing freely for thousands of years. In contrast, there are few, if any, Indian groups that are demographically very large. The truth is that India is composed of a large number of small populations. So this is one way to look at and understand the Indian population structure. Four prehistoric migrations that provided the moving parts or basic components. A 2000 year period of mixing uh, that ensured that almost all population groups in the country are a combination uh, of those four components in some, in, in some proportions, in, different pro in differing proportions. And then a 2000 period of PE, a period of genetic segregation or endogamy that has created a large number of small populations. There's also another visual method that helps us understand the Indian population structure, the metaphor of the Indian demographic pizza, where the base uh, is the ancestry of the first Indians, uh, the descendants of the original out of Africa migrants who reached here 65,000 years ago. This is because we know from genetic in, uh, studies that the ancestry of the first Indians accounts for the majority, 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of most Indian population groups today. This is the most substantive part of the Indian or South Asian ancestry. And uh, without this base, there's no Indian pizza. You could also say that the edges of the Indian pe the pizza base are somewhat thin because uh, the eastern and western borders of India have seen repeated mass migrations over the years, so they have to a comparatively larger extent replaced first Indian ancestry. On top of this comes the source, which are the Harappans. Why is this so? Because when the civilization declined, the Harappans moved both to North India and South India, thus becoming the ancestors of today's North Indians and South Indians. In many ways, the Harappans can be seen as the cultural glue that holds us together because when they moved, the Harappans took with them many of the cultural practices and belief systems that they had perfected in the crucible of the Harappan civilization. And these have now become integrated into the lives and sy belief systems of Indians, both in the north and in the south. For example, the way we build our houses around courtyards, that comes from the way houses were built in, in the Harappan uh, civilization, or the way we consider the pe uh, people tree sacred. There are many seals in the Harappan civilization that show people bowing before a people tree with a deity inside. Um, or, the, or many of the seals that contain p or, or images of deities or people which strongly remind you of yogic uh, po poses or postures. In the north, the Harappans shifted the language they spoke from uh, pre-Aryan languages to Indo-European or Indo-Aryan languages after the arrival of the Arya, but in the south, the language continued to flourish and went on to become Telugu, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, and so on. Um, and uh, there is, of course, the cheese, the idea that spread all over India, but more in the north, uh, uh, to continue the pizza metaphor, more in the north than elsewhere. Uh, there's also the other toppings, the other migrations that came later, which of which the most important are the Austroasiatics, uh, who speak Khasi and Mundari. Uh, spoken by the tribals in, uh, in uh, central India and eastern India and are related to languages in, in, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, etc. And of course, the Greeks, the Sakas, the Suns, the Arabs, the Mughals, the Portuguese, the there's, there's a never ending list. Uh, but none of them made uh, a very large impact on our demography. Uh, some of them may have made a large cultural impact. So that's about as much as we can say. Uh, about the way our population is structured and distributed based on current findings. Very broadly, one can expect the eastern parts of India to carry more uh, eastern, East Asian ancestry, 
the northern and western parts of India to carry more West Eurasian ancestry, and southern parts of India to carry comparatively more First Indian ancestry. For the discussion that will follow this talk, the important points from our prehistory are the four prehistoric migrations, the 2,000 years of mixing that ensure that all Indian population groups have these ancestries in different proportions, and 2,000 years of genetic segregation enforced by the caste system that has made some groups more prone to certain kinds of diseases, a risk that endogamy always carries with it. For our politics and our society, the lessons from our prehistory can be summed up uh, in three phrases. We are all Indians, we are all migrants, and we are all mixed. Unity and diversity is not a cliche. It is the very essence of India. Our achievement is that we have drawn together many different cultures to make a unique civilization of our own. But to boil down all of this diversity and to expect to stuff it into one monochrome or uniform cultural straight jacket would be very un-Indian, uh, prone to mishaps, and doomed to failure. Our success depends on our comfort with diversity. Thank you. Friends, uh, you will all agree with me that uh, the talk of uh, Tony was indeed so interesting that everybody listened to his talk spellbound. As I mentioned in the beginning itself, he has done a monumental work. He has tried to, you know, present the facts on a scientific platform and uh, he, in his talk, he has given solid, convincing reasoning uh, about the subject uh, on which he has uh, written. I would not like to say much because uh, since I have already read the book uh, to a great extent, I would be discussing with him separately. I would uh, just stop here and I would like that uh, more, there should be time, more time for the questions and answers you know, session uh, of the uh, writer with the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Um, we'll open up the floor for discussions. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Um, here. Well, I, this would be addressed to perhaps Tony Joseph and uh, Partho Mozumdar, um, the geneticist. And um, one is in David Reich's account of how that book, you know, who we are and where we came from, when he talks about the spread of Indo-European languages and he brings in the Indian subcontinent, his ancient DNA studies were basically from Swat in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And why has it been so difficult to extract ancient DNA from Harappan sites? Or oh, Mohenjo-daro, yeah. So uh, let me take that question, Tony. Uh, the the uh, big problem that we faced, uh, faced with uh, respect to ancient DNA studies is that when you come to climatic conditions that are very hot, hot and humid, there's so much of fungal growth in any of these uh, remains that it is very difficult to separate the fungal DNA from whatever DNA that we are really trying to, the ancestral DNA, so to say. So uh, this has been a major problem, and it's been a major problem, especially in these parts of the world. So most of the wonderful, uh, um, you know, ancient DNA studies are from places like Siberia, uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans. So we have those kinds of DNA very well preserved, but when we come here because of the hot heat and humidity and fungal growth, this is what has been the problem. When uh, we have the second and the third wave of migrations, 
ultimately they are also essentially evolved out of the same African branch which has spread out and come back. So what is the kind of similarity of the base DNA which is common to ancient in Indian DNA which they are also carrying? I mean I presume that a lot of it is really similar and it's only the more recent changes that would be coming up. So in the sense that the base DNA would be a lot commoner than what seems to be. Uh, that's right. We are really looking at uh, different. I mean, if you take a, as we know already, 99.9 percent, 99.9 percent of the DNA of all human modern humans are the same. So we are really looking at at the global level. You are look, looking at differences that are really, really marginal. Uh, so I don't. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Anil. lecture and I had read you, not the entire book, but I did start reading uh, the book three, two and a half to three months ago, somebody gifted to me. Uh, I'm a linguist and uh, the you said that, uh, I mean, according to the genetics and pop especially population genetic study, the earliest migration was 70,000 years ago. And if I'm right, it was the Andamanis, the great Andamanis, not all the Andaman Islanders. And uh, the genetic study also shows that they lived in isolation all along. If these two positions are correct, then how did they contribute to our ancestry? They didn't. No. All population groups outside of Africa came ultimately from a single group of people who were migrated into Arabian Peninsula around 70,000 years ago. Yes, but the 70,000 years ago, only the Isle uh, Andaman, Great Andamanese Islanders came. The no, rest no. came perhaps later. No. See, even the Ongi and Jarvas, the two tribes. That's not, that's not correct. All populations, even the subsequent migrations that we are talking about, all are descendants of the first out of Africa migration that happened 70,000 years ago. When we said West Asians or agriculturists, that they are also m m descendants of the first out of Africa migrations. Then why do we call them a different name? Because, as I said, during the uh, glacial period, populations got separated. They started revolving, re re revolving around, slightly accumulating minor uh, differences. So you can, to some extent, say these population groups that are separated and when they start migrating again, you could say, yeah, that's a Vestation group that is coming or this is a wide Handagaz or European, uh, you know. Uh, so there are multiple groups that can then be, but ultimately all non-African populations in whatever period that you look at, they all are descendants of the uh, first uh, migration that happened in 70,000 70, years ago. So the Andaman, the only thing that is different from the Andaman uh, islands and the people who are in India would be that uh, Indians went through multiple other migrations that happened in later times and Andamans was, uh, 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 was safe from that until very recently, until the British arrived. Yeah, the and that's a different story altogether. My so second question yeah. was that you were talking about Dravidian migration, but some people were very silent about the local population they met when they came here, which was Austria Munda group. And linguistic evidences are enough to show that in Proto-Dravidian, you have Austro-Asiatic correspondences and the words. The genetic evidence, uh, which is both from ancient DNA, this is a very large study that was done in I from ancient DNA from all of the East Asian, uh, you know, East Asian countries. It's pretty clear that the Austro-Asiatic language group spread with a migration that originally started in the Chinese heartland after their uh, agricultural revolution around 4,000 years ago. And it is the last end of that that reached India around 4,000 years ago that brought Khasi and Mundari uh, into India. And we today know that Khasi and... There were two separate migrations. That's Khasi and Mundari, and they were separated by a few thousand years, which is why Khasi has a very high, you yourself said, empty DNA yeah. uh, from there, whereas you do not find it at all in the Mundaris. There's a... A few thousand years, I would tend to suspect that the Mundaris were people 
they got their South Asia, Southeast Asian uh, component at the time that the rice breeds hybridized. And that was a much earlier migration. And, and one thing you didn't mention a lot, which I think I really was happy about in your book, was that you mentioned that there many of the migrations after the farmer migrations yeah. were male driven. So male driven again from Asia, male driven from the time of the Arya, and that may answer partly your <coughs> question as to why the caste system took a while to come up because there were very few women. And it's only when the community has enough women that they can start closing their borders. Yeah. Uh, Anvita, I was glad to see another linguist here. Yeah. We have tools in linguistics now that go a little beyond what uh, Professor Southworth tried to do. Yeah. He's been talking about this <coughs> since, oh, since I know him, yeah. 1970. Yeah. Uh, however, these have been dealing with words. Yeah. Words are a very, very easy thing to extricate and take. We all use the word origami in English. It doesn't mean we are Japanese. Yeah. However, what tells a lovely story of the Dravidian substratum is not the words. Every single word and affix was replaced in the north, but what was not replaced was the pizza base. Yeah. And the pizza base in the language is not totally familiar Dravidian, but much of it is. Yeah. So we have tools now that allow us to go into not just the sound system, but into the grammar itself. You'll find a lot of things in anyone who knows Hindi and has tried to learn Sanskrit, you know they are not the same. And much of what is different in Hindi has to do with the pizza base, and it's still there. Um, I've been talking to you, yeah. I've written to you before, so we've been in touch. Peggy Mohan. Ah, hi. Yeah. Okay. Um, I agree with most of what you said on the Munda, uh, on the Munda, there's a difference, obviously there's a difference between them. But the commonness of their, uh, that both are part of the Austroasiatic language family yeah. and the, what the genetic evidence shows is a, is, is, is a migration that starts or around for 2000 BCE. Um, that they, it might have come as two separate parts because that, that that's possible, but uh, whether that could be before uh, 2000 BCE, that uh, at least that's not something that genetic evidence would su support as of now. That might change later. Huh? So so if you say so that you're saying that the uh, Munda is 2000 BC, yeah. four thou 2000 BCE, and Kas um, Kasi came later. That's fine. That that wouldn't uh, uh, that that could very well be the case yeah uh, good evening sir look there's, there's a question there uh, just i'll come back to you there's a question there and then i'll come uh, good evening sir thank you for this interesting lecture i am priyank gupta i am from archaeological survey of india so uh, there are some points which i need I, I would like to ask you can you restrict it to one question yes please? yes there yes sir people. Sir, actually, when you uh, mentioned the first, uh, second migration from Jagros to Mehargarh, so I also wanted to ask that there are many rice cultivating uh, sites which we, which we are finding from Middle Ganga Plain. Yes. At the contemporary sites, even at the early Harappan levels also, or the pre Harappan levels at Bhirana, very recent excavations has also yielded some of the uh, co evil dates with the Mehargarh. And also at Kuldhiva and Lauradeva, there are some rice cultivating uh, communities in the Middle Ganga Plain, in the mainland of the Ganga Yamna Doab. Also, in the mature Harappan period, we have five separate uh, Chalcolithic groups, which we call it Jair, Jorve, Malwa, Kaitha, Ahad. So, would you throw some lights on that also, keeping in view the th second and the third uh, flow of the migration which you mentioned? This is the first speech anyway that I have given that I haven't mentioned the Lahura Deva <laughs> because of the time limit. My book goes into in detail on the, on the Lahura Deva uh, to say that there is around the same time as agriculture, uh, there's the beginnings of agriculture in uh, Mehargar, we can see beginnings of uh, rice uh, harvesting in Lahura Deva. We do not have a clear chronology of when exactly the rice harvesting moved into rice cultivation uh, and in any case, we know that rice farming or rice cultivation in the Middle Ganga Plain did not lead into a rice-based civilization in the Middle Ganga Plain at that time, unlike the barley wheat case 
in uh, in Mehergaon and uh, remaining region. The reason I would suspect is that we had to wait, as my book talks about it. The reason I suspect is that the real productivity of rice uh, happened only when, after it was hybridized with the Jap Japonica variety that arrived, Mu and that happened much later. It's probably around 4000 BCE. So it did not have the kind of productivity that was necessary for a civilization to rise out of it. So that's my, so in any case, I make a point that it is wrong to think that agriculture just began in one place and spread everywhere. That I, as I made in this speech also, that agriculture was experiments and successful agriculture began in multiple places. And it is also clear from both the Mahargar and uh, Lahura Deva that first Indians were experimenting with agriculture around the same time as uh, uh, you know other other population groups were. That's right. Right. There's yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, two very brief questions. One is that we all have heard about Lucy, yeah. the first mother. Yeah. Now. Is it correct to think that there was only one mother or there were many mothers at the same time? Multiple. <laughs> Pardon? I th uh, many mothers, I think. Okay. I think as we find the discover more, we are realizing that many simple assumptions such as there was one, ma one event that brought modern humans into being is not true. Okay. Modern humans are the result of multiple uh, mixings between very different homo groups that were prevalent at that time. There's no one single moment that would uh, that would uh, uh, that would denote the emergence of modern human. Yeah. Thank you. The second question is: uh, We are able to sort of uh, access the DNA in uh, Harappa and all that because they were not burning the body; they were burying. When did we start in India burning the body of the dead? Uh, this is not something that I have, uh, I can answer much, but I can say that even in the Rig Veda, oh, both are mentioned, where there is burning as well as, uh, mm, uh, as well as burial, as far as I know. So, I don't think it has been exclusive either way, through the ages, but, but yeah. to answer you deeply, it will require more research. Yeah, uh, Tony, you've uh, given a great presentation. I'm Raghav Chandra, a civil servant, uh, interested in the tribes. So, uh, you know, your uh, general focus has been on the agro-pastoralists who came in different waves, and yet we have the Sentinelese, for instance, who have just not exposed themselves, and you, s genes uh, genetists would probably say that they came from the same Lucy, the same mother in Africa. What is your take on the scheduled tribes, you know, and tribes as we understand are those who did not necessarily convert themselves to agriculture, who lived in the forests, lived a more exclusive or reclusive life, mostly hunter-gatherers. Where did they fit in into this larger uh, scheme? Uh, were they people who came in in the first, first, first wave? And why did they not get converted by the external influences? Is that because they did not want to be converted? Or were there uh, geographical factors? Uh, what is your uh, understanding on that? Uh, first, I think it's they are first Indians. J just as we all of us carry first Indian ancestry. I wanted you to say that. Very I'm clearly. Glad. And in fact, uh, you again, this is the first time I've focused much more on multidisciplinary. So a lot of points that I usually make in every speech you went away in this one. And one of them was tribals are us. Because there is a usual <coughs> assumption among uh, us in quotation marks, of course. There's a usual assumption that the rest of the population is somehow very different from the tribals. <coughs> what, the gen what the research so far very clearly says is that if there is any population group that the, uh, that the rest of the population shares the maximum ancestry with, that's the tribals. The tribals are us, in uh, inverted commas, in other words, sorry. So this is a very, I'm glad that you raised it and I could say this, and uh, this is the very important point. In terms of why some groups haven't taken to agriculture and some have, um, the multiple, I mean, there's more anthropological reasons for it. And also you should remember that it's not for someone, 
uh, I remember reading an interview with a uh, uh, interview that was done more than a hundred years ago about uh, uh, an anthropologist talking to uh, uh, a hunter gazra in Australia who is actually helping with the farmer family, white wa- farmer family. These are hunter gatherers are obviously aborigines, and they are helping him actually farm, and they are not doing the farming themselves. Uh, in their own land, because but they are still doing hunting, hunting gathering. So the interview is to understand why are you doing this? Why are you not farming yourself? And they say we can't understand the reasoning for this. When there is, uh, when you can have hunting and gathering, and you can everything that is available for you, why do you have to work like this? It doesn't make sense to me. So even though they are, uh, uh, so I'm saying that there are. Uh, this can be understood in a more anthropological fu- uh, uh, manner. Not si- not easy to give a simple answer, but valid point. Yeah, thank you for raising it. About burning of bodies, uh, have you ever been through the uh, question exploring that? Uh, what would have led to burning of bodies? Uh, no, this is not a question I can I can answer. No. Okay. Good evening, sir. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, since you've uh, been uh, doing this uh, academic, uh, academic practice for the last six years, what is your opinion on India devising a uh, same uh, database of genomes where you can uh, trace your genomic history, just like the case of Turkey? Like, what is your opinion on India doing that and, and then the whole uh, many applications related to that data bank? Uh, India is in the Indian government? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, are, 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 is, is our society ready for such an ancestral detailed history of uh, through our genes? Are we ready for this dehyphenation? Uh, I have not followed the what exactly the government is doing, so it would be wrong of me to uh, on in this area. So I would, would be wouldn't be correct of me to comment. I will look into it. Yeah. Is the the, what the government is to, what the government is doing? I'm not clear to me. Uh, I don't know what, what is the scientific term for that, but you, your DNA details maybe, and then you can trace your history. You know, people were sharing that Ancestors they belong to Transoxiana, Khorasan. So, like that, are we ready for this? Just a similar. So it's not a question of being ready. I don't know whether we are ready or not. This question I cannot answer. But what the Department of Biotechnology is trying to do right now is to create a national database uh, of of genomes of Indian people but completely stripped of you know, all of the identifiers, right? So it can be used as for academic purposes such as this, but it will be stripped of all of the identifiers, and we are all engaged in that, uh, in, in that enterprise right now. A question there and then I'll come to you. Thank you. It's very interesting that the Harappan language is akin to the Elamite and Dravidian languages. So then why hasn't it been, uh, the Harappan language script been deciphered? Uh, s- many scripts that uh, scripts that have been deciphered, for example, uh, have you often had uh, what is called a Rosetta Stone, or a, a, or, or y- they have found something that the same thing is written in different scripts. These are because most of the scripts they are likely to be logosyllables. They are not like our modern scripts. So the it's difficult to without a Rosetta Stone, uh, which, as I said, where multiple scripts are are, are written dealing with the same subject it would be di- it would be difficult to uh, decipher the harappan script because also it's not a very large number of things that we have from the script it's possible that that they were using methods other than uh, like what you call ma- the, sc- yeah. the uh, clay uh, for writing down and that uh, but the w- those must have been more perishable things that are no longer available to us so i wouldn't be very uh, optimistic on us uh, deciphering the script unless we strike lucky and come across a Rosetta Stone of the p- some kind. A quick, quick comment. Somebody asked about why didn't people become farmers. In Australia, the, farm, the crops and the animals that were farmed were all imported. The local animals and the local crop, the local plants were not very easy to grow. And that is a case that happens in a large number of countries uh, all of the North, Ameri- North American, South America. Now, 
It's like saying you can domesticate the horse, but you would really not be lucky if you tried to domesticate the zebra. It would rather die than let anyone use it. So basically, they were out of luck. And in Australia, there were no native crops and no native animals that were susceptible to domestication. So the sheep that came, the wheat that came, came from Europe. There's a question there. Is just that in all the things that you uh, in all the things that you found, uh, is there preferably something that's not in your book? But what is the most stark or most interesting thing that you found, and preferably something that you may not have included in your book? Is there some nugget like that? <laughs> well, I can say this: different people have found different parts of the book interesting. <laughs> 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 No, there is a one that I would pick out. Um, difficult to say. The fact that uh, I think what I mean, what I missed out in this, that the all of us share the f this the first Indian ancestry. How strong that is is not something that I knew, and I I don't think most of us knew, and that's why I think we used to ask where can we find the first Indians. We are the first Indians. We share it across the country, and uh, it's stunning to me. Because all of our history starts on the wrong from the uh, from the wrong uh, starting point. It starts with the Harappan civilization, or it starts with verse, you know, with the Vedic civilization, which is even later. Both do not start with where the majority of our ancestry comes from, which is sixty-five thousand years ago. You could say that that's because we didn't know anything about it. Yeah, that's right. Since this is prehistory, we don't have enough information about it. Now is the time to change it. Now it, our history has to begin when people arrive here 65,000 years ago, which is why the first part of this chapter, that's the one that took me longest. That was the most, most difficult part to put together. But it was important to put it together. Why? Because I think that's where our history has to begin. That's our real history. Yeah. Uh, how and when Indians became vegetarian and uh, why vegetarianism is unique to India? Uh, it's there in the book. Uh, it's there in the book actually. Uh, it's a, it, uh, not why, but I think some aspects of, uh, of the differing uh, dietary preferences between different parts of the country. We have a time? This will take a little time. Should I go into it? Uh, this will take at least five, five, so, seven minutes. Uh, so, uh, if it takes <laughs> five, ten minutes, just hang on. Are there <laughs> any other questions? We'll just break. And then you can go ahead and answer him. Uh, yes. I'll, I'll come to you. Just give Sir, I'm Manuel Joseph from ASI. Some uh, linguists do say that uh, the in the Rig Veda, there are uh, some add-on words, uh, ad stratum, they say, uh, which is from Proto-Mundari. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, somebody says uh, Gimbutas, uh, I think, Mi Michael Witzel uh, all say that uh, it's Proto-Munnari. And uh, then the uh, Dravidian uh, comes later. So that means Witzel, uh, Michael Witzel says like that. So uh, it means that uh, if and when they came from uh, whatever the steppe, so then it should be from that region where uh, the Munda, uh, Mundas were already there. No. We now know that Munda, Khasi languages are related, are part of Austroasiatic languages. They are related to languages that are in... Uh, an No, no, you're talking about language, not... Uh, language, I'm talking about language. It's a two-stranded pattern. Uh, anyway, you'll yeah. see in a few yeah, words yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a question uh, here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, one is that it's a very comprehensive study, and I learned a lot because that's not my idea. But given this, coming back to the point that these bodies were buried at some time, Second, that DNA being fragile and hence cannot be extracted as efficiently given the microbial infections. So uh, how do you weigh in the links which might be missing, you know, because of this missing DNA? So whatever inferences uh, you have drawn, they are strongly, many of them are strongly dependent on the genetic studies. So given that the genetic study, the base of that is missing very often, 
how do you quantify those links to be present, which are not links which are present but maybe not <coughs> visible to us as yet? Do you want to answer that? So, what links are missing? Did you say? As in, uh, like you know, where you can't get the DNA. DNA is the has been the major source through which we have made the connections. Yes. And given that uh, I it's a technical question that you know sometimes your DNA cannot be extracted because of uh, it's not present or it has been degraded or it has been covered by uh, fungal infections, etc. So you may not have substantive amount of something which you are using to link between any two events or two eras. Okay. Right? Okay. I think and second, one quick question more, that because of the endog endogamy in the caste system, have there been any genetic disorders identified because of the not mixing but, you know, uh, the endogamy within the caste system? Yes, the second question, but uh, uh, the, the first one, um, what's happening now, which is why I emphasize the fact throughout the first half of the presentation, which is that what's happening is a revolution in prehistory across the, across the globe. So it is not, and what, what is being, what we are seeing is a j global jigsaw puzzle being filled. Uh, and that is a global jigsaw puzzle because mo these kind of uh, global migrations that are, that are backed by global forces that are, uh, you know, that we can see, they are no respecter of boundaries, either national or too, uh, at least not too much of e even natural boundaries. Uh, so it is when you see the picture even if one part one small part of the uh, a jigsaw puzzle is is missing or it's not there depending on the on how the whole picture or, or, or how much of the whole picture that you have it's it's not it's not difficult to see uh, where migrations uh, are moving or they are moving out from and as we have also seen it also allows you from the existing evidence that we have there are there are um, uh, uh, options or possibilities that we can rule out. So both these things have to be taken into account. That is a jigsaw puzzle, and that uh, av available evidence does do allow us to rule out certain possibilities and options, which I had talked about in my uh, talk. The answer to the second question is yes. I'm not going to name diseases, but the answer to your second question is yes. Right. If there are uh, no further questions, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Shudipto. Um, to Tony, uh, you mentioned about the first Indians. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious, the the multidisciplinary study that one is talking about, are there clear uh, sociological or cultural studies which are also filling in you spoke about religion to an extent but better markers probably exist in social practices uh, is that an area of study that's participating in this or no because remember that most of what uh, the proper part of a book ends when the Aryans arrive the rest of uh, the caste system etc are all in the epilogue where I am the only part of the book where I'm looking you looking at things more subjectively and the intro to the chapter says so. So when you're talking about this part, it's all prehistory. Prehistory by definition means it is before writing has begun. So there is no, forget about uh, write, we don't even know the names of people or places in prehistory, right? Because there, nobody has written them down. So there's the, the kind of things that you talked about to the part that I dealt with in this first book, they're not available, they're not, they, they can't be had. In the next book that I am writing, yes, you would see them. So, I was specifically asking about, say, Bhimbetka, huh. the findings around, the, in the villages around Bhimbetka. Today, yeah. yeah. So, the, the, the kind of artwork that they have and what they do, th there's a lot of similarity that's been seen. That's right. Uh, I have not looked at most closely. The sad thing is that the dating of the uh, paintings in Bhimbetka are very poor and not, uh, not enough. Uh, of, uh, of of understanding is there. I have, I've been trying to do get that for for the purpose of this book, but it has been quite uh, disappointing to see. Uh, maybe it is very difficult to do so. Uh, but yeah, I think it would be interesting to uh, dig in. Not something that I've looked at, but it would be a good thing to do. 
Can I make a general comment to well, the, the issue that you raised? Yes, please. In reconstructing human evolution, we use traits. There are different kinds, sets of traits that we can use. Genetic traits, linguistic traits, cultural traits. In reconstructing human evolution, the kind of traits that we would like to use are traits that evolve slowly and not too fast. So, for example, genes or languages, they evolve much faster than genes do. So if you're going to reconstruct biological evolution, you really want such traits. And that's where we find sometimes major differences between language and genetics, because languages are evolving faster. On the other hand, there are certain kinds of uh, you know, questions that we might ask where languages and cultural traits might actually play a much better role than genes do. But reconstructing biological evolution, we don't want very fast evolving traits. Oh, that's, that's, uh, the, the time scales are very different. I had a, a, a sort of a lob question. Let me try and construct it uh, for everyone's understanding. Um, you know, from an orthogonal system of understanding, we went into the spherical system of understanding to a relativistic way of understanding in math, the mathematics. And we made leaps and bounds in terms of mathematical understanding. Can you put us in some sort of perspective on how this multidisciplinary study might take us to in the future about our understanding of the past? Is it going to make that kind of a difference where from an orthogonal system we migrate to a Cartesian to a, uh, a spherical system and uh, from a spherical to a, you know, if, if you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I can't, uh, what has happened in the I think we are too early in terms of uh, the impact of what we have discovered in recent times, even about ourselves, how that has been, how that will be uh, influence us. Yeah, I tried in, in my usual presentation, there is um, the implications of the findings. Uh, I've written about five of those implications that we should change the way we look at ourselves and our society and our culture and our politics. And even when writing this, I know that this is too early to say this. Because real way that this understanding of who we are will change us, will take time to play itself out. You, uh, because this is quite a radical change. Because look at it. So far, what have we, our understanding of our culture and history has been that, uh, you know, it all starts with the uh, idea of Sanskrit Vedic foundation and then that's, that has changed substantially. The idea of Sanskrit Vedic foundation is an important part of our culture, but it's not the only one, and it's not the earliest one. And we are, in much more a uh, deeper sense, um, a, a deeper sense, a, a, a confluence of cultures. We are, we are, uh, we now know, for example, that uh, it would be right to see, look at ourselves. We are a common civilizational, conversational area. The topics that we discuss, debate about, argue about are the same. But we do not have a common set of answers. Why is that? Because we have our uh, sets of answers come from the different experiences and cultural histories that we carry among ourselves. But that doesn't change the fact that we, uh, a fact that, our set that we have unique questions that we debate about and argue about. So, so I think th a lot of the more important implications of of a better understanding of our ourselves will take time to to come about. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank I you. think we had a fantastic evening. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.